How sweet it is for those who love the Lord when they come together. There's no better words that the, than the psalmist when he sings. And when you look at the psalms that were written for worship, and the idea that as they would travel towards the city of Jerusalem, that they could see the temple, because the temple was the highest thing as anyone as they would approach, from any direction that you would come from, no matter what gate you would come from, and you'd enter into that great city, you would look and you would see that temple, and that temple to them represented, this is where God's at. And they, they were so joyful about it. I hope that you would keep that in your heart. I hope that more people would start to realize what joy it is and what a great reward it is for us to be together. We share such wonderful things in our Savior. A few years back, one of my mountain buddy, biking buddies, he asked me, he said, so Ron, are you guys you going to do a sunrise service for Easter? I said, dude, I don't get up at sunrise. And then I was joking. And then I realized... Oops, that, was, that might have been a little insulting to him because they do. And then I said, oh. I said, no. I said, no, we don't. He goes, well, well, why not? I said, because every Sunday is a day in which we celebrate the resurrection. And so it's, it's not an extra special day to us. And that's important to know. But it's also important for us to know that we take it, and I'm saying this in a, in a nice way, but we may take it as something casual because we're celebrating it every Sunday, but we need to be aware that the world doesn't. Most people don't recognize the importance of the resurrection. And so if this is a moment in which we can have people's attention about this great victory over death then let's talk about it but as far as any day no we we understand the history of it it's very catholic you know you even the catholic you can't get around the history of it it's written it's esther i mean the whole name itself is is very paganistic i'm not trying to be insulting just look at the history of it that's the fact but it is an important moment. It is something that we do need to look at. And so I want us to look at Isaiah 53. So if you've got a Bible, if you don't, we have pew Bibles in front of you. Now, my translation that I use is a ESV, English Standard Version. You know, I think ours are New King James in there. It's not quite different, but I'm also going to have it up here. What I want to do is I want to read Isaiah 53, and I'm going to have that up on the screen, and then we're going to come back and take a look at some aspects of it that maybe we haven't quite pulled together about this. And, and I say that, <laughs> I'm including you with me because I know over the years I've listened to this being read and used so much that we, I, I just go too quickly over some of the passages in it. And, I, and some of the words will you know, kind of click and go, I wonder what that kind of meant. That's okay, it's beautiful. You know, it's, it's wonderful, the concepts and stuff. And then when you dig into it and you look at it, oh, wow. Wow. That's what I want to give you. I want to give you the wow. And not just to entertain, but so that you can see the magnificence of what Isaiah is writing. And we know that he did the writing, but it was the Holy Spirit that articulated through him that message so this message is really from our father so let's go ahead and read who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed for he grew up before him like a young plant like a root out of dry ground he had no form or majesty that we should look up at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man. Men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we were healed. We are all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like the sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Out of the anguish of his soul, we shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, we sh shall the righteous one, my servant, make many according uh, accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now just real quick, just with that reading, I think it's easy to see some aspects of it that we're, we're, we're acquainted with. But honestly, this was a mystery to the Jew. As, as Isaiah wrote it, penned it, read it, it confused them. It was like a mixed message, you know, like you double talk. You know, through the prophets, one moment they would be saying, there's this Messiah coming, this king, this new kingdom, this king's going to come and rule, and he's going to take over, and the world will never be the same again. And then all of a sudden we get this, he's going to be rejected. He's going to be abused. And he's going to be discarded. What? So these are some of the things that when we look in the New Testament and when Paul talks about the mystery being revealed, these are a part of those, those connections that God kept a little secret a little secretive. And it was a way that when the impact on the day of Pentecost and when the gospel went forward was just lighting up everything because then they could look at it. And then the Jews could look at it and go, He is the man of sorrows. He is the one that Isaiah was talking about. And when Paul would talk about it and quote these scriptures, there's no other conclusion you could come to than that this man, Jesus, was the one that was prophesied about. I'm still a little confused, they would say, that how could he be a king? How could he be a priest? How could he be one that's a man of sorrows because kings are in power? And there was a lot of other things that they would grapple with, but that was a part of the unveiling that process that was going on. But Isaiah, Isaiah 53, is written so incredible. The way that he breaks it down, it's, it's I don't even know how to describe that because of the layers and the way that he's able to write this message to the people who are alive right then and there that are listening to this message for the first time, and yet still, if you read it a thousand years later, two thousand years later, it would come alive just as much. So he's writing it with this three-dimensional kind of writing style that we can't grasp. That if you're in that moment in time when you read it, you would see it a certain way. And then when later on, it's a part of that dynamic Word of God, the way that it would still apply and come alive for you. And that's why, even us today, how wonderful it is as we look at that. 
So he starts out by saying, who has believed what they heard from us? Now that, that again, that, that applies a couple of ways because the prophets had been talking to them and giving them this message. So there was a part where it was very applicable for them. They would say, well, all the prophets have been rejected. But if it was after the day of Pentecost and you were a Christian or you were an apostle going out and trying to establish, you know, the word of God, you know, and getting people to believe, this would be so much on your heart, wouldn't it? Who's listening to us? Who is believing us? Paul wrestled with that in the book of Romans and trying to help the Jews to understand how could you reject such a beautiful message? How could you reject such a perfectly clear message that God had put together and not see it now? You ever seen people like that? You, 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 no matter how you try to draw it out, they still can't figure out what you're trying to say. Maybe it's me, you know, that can't communicate it. But who has believed what they have heard from us? And to whom the arm of the Lord has been revealed? So the two questions... And that's what's amazing. And it still deals with the exact same message to those then and those of the first century, especially because, but that word arm is what kind of throws us a little. You see, in the Hebrew, that was power. The arm. So now that I said that, think about it again. Who has believed the power of the Lord? So to those that were listening to it would have to think back about all that Moses had done, all the things that they had witnessed through historical events and things. If you were sitting after the cross, you would be as an apostle or Christians going, who has believed what the Messiah has accomplished? I mean, he walked on water. He fed 5,000. He healed the blind. All those things he did. And yet they crucified him. He himself was the message, was he not? He was the gospel in flesh, incarnate, loving, forgiving, teaching through everything that he did. He was God's report. He was the one that was touching their lives with power. And yet what they do with it. For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root without dry ground. That's a vulnerable picture, isn't it? A young plant trying to survive in a soil that's not suited for him. A young plant that you know, looking at the soil, it's going to come up and it's going to start to want to thrive. But knowing that soil is going to kill it. That's the Lord. That's Jesus. And the other part of this well is the root. Listen to the word. If you were a Jew, and especially whether it was before when Isaiah wrote it or afterwards, you know what that means. That's genealogy. The house of David? What did the house of David mean when Jesus came? By the time Jesus came, you think they were thinking much of their tribe and the distinctions of the tribes? They were not. They were not. They, they were a mess. They were, you know, I mean, before they divided, they were very proud about their heritage and which tribe they came from. And then you find the kingdom split. The ten northern tribes had become called Israel. And the southern was Judah. So everybody that's around there, you know. Now, now remember, what, what tribe was he from? Judah. So it became nonchalant. It's like, yeah, we're Judah. And then the ten other tribes get wiped out by the Assyrians, never to return again. But there's a remnant of them who migrated to the south and joined in with Judah. They then go off into captivity. They come back. And because that's really the most significant name, Judah... They end up with the name Jew. Duh. Jew. They don't 
they, they've lost the significance of it. So when you say that this Messiah is coming from this genealogy of David, it had become washed. And so the prophet here is kind of insinuating that what is the house of David anymore? This root, this plant that rolls up in this environment before him is before the Lord. He rose up before the Lord. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. You ever seen the difference between a farmer and a lawyer if you dressed them identical? Let's just say you put them both in a three-piece suit. Do you think you could pick out the difference between a farmer and a lawyer? Just look at their brow. Just look at their skin. Just look at their hands. You, you'll be able to tell real quickly, dude, you don't belong in a suit. That is not you. If you were to look at him, what would you see? Would you see a man who had been groomed and brought up in the ways of majesty, of king, of one that would, was like a sire that would come along you know, and taken care of to take over the throne, the next succession to the, the rule of Judah? Or, or would you see a man who was a carpenter who had lived his life outdoors and had become weathered? What do you want to see? You see, that, that's, that's kind of the point here, isn't it? What do you want to see? And that's a challenge today because I see people all the time wanting to see what they want in the Lord. They don't like what they see when they hear something different. And that's what was going on with this. And it was a physical description he's saying here, but really, it's also something very spiritual, isn't it? So he showed up with no recognition. He didn't look like a king. He wasn't educated like a king. That's the environment he come from. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. So what does that mean to you? Let me tell you what it means to him. He lived it. God didn't come into the flesh and become numb to the physical body that he was inside of. That's an impossibility. That's almost kind of against the physics of God, and that doesn't exist, by the way. That's not a real thing. But it's, it's not right. Because, you see, we are created in his image, and we have a spirit that comes from him. And so what happens is when you take a spirit and you put it in the human body, the body starts to affect the spirit and the spirit affects the body. There's a whole new dynamic that goes on in this fleshly dimension. God could not come into this flesh without experiencing it. That's why you hear things in the Hebrews talking about how he learned obedience. How does a God learn something? That always blew my mind. That always blew my mind. He was acquainted with grief. People that he loved, and you don't think he didn't love people more than everyone? You don't think he wanted to serve people more? Before he came on the stage and started his, his gospel or his mission, you know, and started teaching and stuff, you think that he became what we read in those three short years? That that's when he was so loving and kind and tender? Every tragic thing that was going on around him, death of his friends, his family, the tragedies that he would hear about affected him. And he couldn't, you can't stop that unless you're a psychopath and you have no emotions at all. But that's not him. So he was very acquainted. He was very familiar because he experienced it. This is the problem I have with the Gnostics 
and with some who try to minimize the deity of Christ. And I say deity is the aspect of Godhood. Because see, that, that's always been a problem with me growing up, was thinking that it's, not, it's really not fair. You know, I mean, you tell me that God came in the flesh, but I always had this idea that, you know what, it, you, know, you can talk all day and tell me, you know, yeah, you know what I'm going through, but you've already existed before you came here. I didn't. And you're going to go back, and you know where you're going. You got it down. So how bad can it really be? Honestly. How can you really relate to me? It's like a rich man or a, one of these big politicians coming down and living in my house for a week or two. Guess where they're going to go lay their head? Where do you think Bill Gates is going to go back and sleep? You know, when he goes to Africa or they go on these big journeys and they, we were down there serving people, you know, and we're helping the, look at me, you know, pictures with all these, these all this suffering and carnage around them. Where do you think they go back and live? They go back to their mansions, don't they? So when I thought of God, I kind of thought, well, okay, yeah, okay. His son came down, he got into this, this human form, and, but no, no he, had a, he had what you call kind of an ace up the sleeve, you know, kind of this trump card thing where he had something that I didn't have. Wrong. That violates all the other scriptures that talk about the idea that he had to suffer. He had to be just like us. That was a part of the perfect sacrifice. Otherwise, he wasn't perfect. The whole idea was he had to come, be in the form of a human, be limited to the body of a human, be tempted like a human, have the full capability of sinning just like everybody else. Otherwise, it's fake. It's fake. God, you're tricking us. And he's not. So when we read this passage, and we see when he says that he was acquainted with grief, I want you to understand, he knew every tear you dropped. He felt it. Do you remember Lazarus? When Jesus went, and as he was arriving, Mary came out and said, our brother is dead. If you would have just been here, you could have saved him. And he says, do you not, Mary, Mary, do you not believe in the resurrection? Well, well yes. He goes, where's, where's, where's Lazarus at? And so she takes him. And as they're approaching, the other sister approaches Lord, where were you? If you would have been here, our brother would have lived. Do you not believe that in the resurrection? Well, well, yes. And while he stood there in front of that grave, looking around, he saw the pain and the suffering that humanity was going through, just a small little segment of what was happening of, around the world, really, with all humans. And here he had been diligently trying to demonstrate to them the greatness of God's love through him, for them. And they couldn't see it. They, they couldn't see it. And then it says, Jesus wept. That was a true emotion. It was not fake. It wasn't like we see politicians where they stage things for a photo op. Jesus wept. He was a man who was familiar with grief. I think we minimize that sometimes when we go over these passages. And as one whom from hide their faces, I think of Job. I think of Job when sometimes people are suffering, they automatically reject them. 
There's a part where, you know, they looked at him and they wanted to say, well, you're getting what you deserve, Job. And this is what the writer's kind of building up to here, is the idea that, you know, whenever, when the, when the things were going good, people liked him. But when things went bad, they rejected him. He's a man of sorrows, yes, and there's that multi-layer again. This idea of what he suffered for us, but also the way that he could relate to us. And then he brings, the author brings it into this idea that from whom men hide their faces. Who wants to hang out with somebody who is suffering so much? They don't want to be associated with it. And if we layer that on top of another idea, what did Peter do when the Lord was drugged before the council? And when the suffering started then, what did Peter do? That's my guy, man. That's my Lord. That's the Son of God over there. No, he esteemed him not. And he hid his face. Do we do that? Do we become a shame of our faith sometimes? That we don't esteem our Lord? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. It's pretty clear here. This, this, is, this is something that, again, if you're looking for a king to come in and get rid of those nasty Romans, he's not your guy. This is not the one. You're missing it again. What are, what, what are we broke about? See, that, that's the idea. Is what, what, are, what are we really lacking in our lives? You know, it's like we're like little children. Sometimes my, my, my boys would come to me and they'd say, well, this is what I need. This is what I need in my life. This is going to make life just wonderful. This is what I need. I'm going, you don't need any of that. You don't get it. And that's what we're like sometimes. We want a Lord that fits what we want. We have our own expectations. But our Heavenly Father knows what we really need. And He gave it to us. And He gave it to us. And He demonstrated that we have a lack of appreciation for it. So boldly that it came out in such an innocent one. That it was so bold and in our face, even to this day. How can you not look at yourself in relationship to that cross and understand something. He was crushed. Upon him, the chastisement that brought us peace. I, I remember one time I sold my little brother out big time. I got in trouble. It was my fault. I was so mad at my little brother. We were on the outs. Most of the time growing up, right? And I said, he did it. Being the middle child, we're pretty good about getting away with stuff. And my dad believed it. And then I had to watch my little brother take one of the worst whoopings from my dad with a belt and cry. And, I, and that broke me. I sold him out. I esteemed him not. I hid my face. I let him take that from me. And I got away with it. And that's just a simple, silly little human relationship story there. This is bigger. This is much bigger, isn't it? He took that for us. But he brought us peace because of that. And with his stripes, we are healed. And when I think of those stripes, I think of the brutality that was unleashed upon him. The injuries alone from a scourging 
was a death sentence. Even if Pilate, after he scourged him and everybody said, okay, that's brutality, you know, go ahead, we'll, we'll take him over Barabbas, let him go. The odds were over 98% chance he would die. You, you didn't survive Roman scourging. You really didn't. They didn't have antibiotics. And, and what's even worse about this one was the fact that the scourger, that they had professional scourgers. I mean, these guys knew how to, how to scourge and inflict a particular level of injury upon a person that they were told to do. This scourging that was put upon him was excessive. It was worse than any other scourging that a normal person would get before crucifixion. The fact that he was even still alive, standing before Pilate, is pretty amazing based on his injuries. Medical professionals even say that. The fact that he's even able to hold a conversation because of this brutality that was thrown upon him. And that's that idea, that concept of being crushed, being wounded. And yet through all of that, we're the benefactors. We're the ones who gain from this. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. I don't know, it's, it's really fascinating to go to the Department of Corrections of different states, and you'll find there's a list of last statements. The person being executed on death row, sorry. And, and I don't know, one year I, w I was studying, I was, I was looking at the idea of capital punishment. And so I was going in and looking at the capital punishment and all these issues, and, and all of a sudden I found that last statements of people who were being executed. And I just kind of went through those. It's something that kind of, a common thread that came up was either they never said a word or they were completely repentful about it. But there were a few that just jumped out. And what was interesting was the idea that they still remained thinking that they were innocent somehow. But the last words of people are something that become very significant. The last words that you remember you spoke with somebody that you loved that passed away have so much power. Now, you put yourself in a situation where all the injustice has been inflicted upon you and all the people that are standing there watching you die like it's a circus and gambling away your clothes. And you're hanging there thinking, I created you. The dust that's under your feet right now, the sandals, I created. You have no idea. The song that we sing, He Could Have Called 10,000 Angels, is phenomenal to me. The restraint, because as the Hebrew writer said, He set the cross before Him with joy. Because it wasn't about him, it was about you. Because he knew, like a father and a mother know, sometimes the child cannot save themselves. And they will never understand what I'm doing for them. And maybe I'll be long gone before they'll finally reflect and go, you know what, that was the most beautiful thing my, my mom or dad did for me. But at the time, I never got it. And he was able to understand that that he had to take this. But was he really silent? He spoke. We've, we've got the recordings, right? So it's not that he was mute. What the writer's saying here is, he didn't do like most of the men and people that were being executed on the crucifix, because they would hang there. They would hang publicly, 
and people would walk by him. And don't you think they had some words to say? Most of them would beg either to put them out of their misery or, you know, help me get, get me down when the sun goes down or some sort of thing like that. Or it'd be striking out vehemently. But everything that he said had nothing to do with saving him, justifying anything. Well, it's amazing if you go back and you correlate everything that he said was like book, chapter, verse. Like, like preachers and people do today when they give you book, chapter, and verse. For the Jews who are standing there, when he, every one of those statements that he says were not only so applicable that we don't even get it, because one, we're not Jewish, but they pointed them to a psalm. where they could go back after he was dead and go, he said that. And then they read the psalm. And the whole psalm cried out about who he was. Every one of those things he said went back to where something they could reference and realize he truly was the Son of God. How could he sit there and do that? But the most other one that I think is so beautiful is when he looked on everyone and he said, Father, forgive them for they don't understand what they're doing. Oppressed, oppression and judgment, he was taken away, was taken away and was for his generation who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. This is a multi-layered one as well. This is the concept that it was an illegal trial, that he lost the just trial and was oppressed and suppressed from that idea. And, and that's another hard to replicate or something to where when the Jew looked at this, and then they looked at the actual trial and execution and the process and the historical events, they'd have to go, that's exactly what happened to him. That was comp what the Pharisees did in trying him after dark, completely illegal. The charges, his, his justice was withheld from him. He was cut out of the land of the lineage. Now when he talks about of his generation, his life, there's, there's this idea that if he's dead... It's done. It's over. Finit. Finally got rid of him. How's he going to carry on? What's going to happen? What's going to happen to your generation? What's coming next? He had no children. And this is where he's building up to this idea that it goes way beyond that. The people looked and thought, and the leaders thought, aha, he's gone. We got him. We got him off. He's done. The writer goes on and just demonstrates how wrong they were. They even made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. This is one of these as well that when people try to tell me, well, you know, he just kind of copied. He had the old book, you know, he had the Old Testament. So he was able to just go through and say, okay, guys, we got to do this today, okay, in order so that we can make it fit, make me look like I'm the Messiah. How did he pick the grave in which he was buried? Because I guarantee you there wasn't, there wasn't anyone that was going to be in charge or power that was going to be able to find this grave that they put him in. That was a dislocate. Remember? Who went and asked for his body? Joseph. Who wasn't a disciple that was not hanging out with the disciples, did not collaborate with the disciples, but on his own initiative went and requested his body to be put in his grave. He was a rich Pharisee. Totally separate. That's something out of control. Jesus didn't get to coordinate this to where somebody would put him in this grave. Another proof text of who he was. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It was to put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. 
he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now we go to exaltation. We go and he now shows that no matter what is going on, this was the purpose. This is the same message that on the day of Pentecost, after he had gone through the apostles and shown how that the prophets had been talking about this and that you are all guilty, everybody's guilty of crucifying him and saying, what does he do? When he wraps up toward the end of it, he says, but that was God's plan. That's the reason some things had to be hidden in order to fulfill this plan, to bring that through. It was his plan to make him endure all of that so that through that, his offspring, Christians, are his offspring. That's the generation. His generation was not cut off like what man thought it was going to be. It was cut off from the physical land, but not the most powerful, and that was the spiritual one. Out of anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. As he was hanging on that cross, he knew what he was doing. And I think it ties with what the Hebrew writer was saying as well. That the comprehension of understanding the glory that was coming. And now, what was his last words? It is finished. No, it didn't mean that he had two more heartbeats and one breath and I'm dead. God's magnificent plan was complete. That thousands of years before, when the Father commanded it, He brought the world in. Before He even started that, He understood that He would come and have to do this. And through the thousands of years of watching and working with man and going, Jesus wasn't asleep. Jesus wasn't a third party during the Old Testament. If you go through, you can do a study. You will see Jesus was there. He was talking to Abraham. He was there. Sodom and Gomorrah. He was there. And he watched the suffering of mankind. He saw the wickedness of man. And he knew the cross was coming. But it wasn't time. So year after year, century after century goes by. And when he was born, even the angels rejoiced, didn't they? And those last words he said, it is finished, was the most beautiful thought he had. Lord, Father, God, Father, I've done it. We have done it. We have defeated Satan. What glory now will reign because of this. And so he says, in conclusion, he says, therefore, because of all that he just stated, he says, because of this, I will divide a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. A reminder of what he sacrificed, but also the idea that we are going to receive a portion of this great inheritance of his. And look at the very last. This is a link and a shadow that they would never see, and most even Christians today don't really see this part. This intercession for transgressors is again one of those multi-layered because who did that for the Jews? Only a priest could do that. So that was a, a scholar, a, a Hebrew scholar reading this would be even more confused. It, it, this man would be even more mysterious of Isaiah 53. Whoa. One, he's a criminal. <laughs> He's going to be beaten and tortured, and he's going to die. He's going to be cut off from the land, and then he's going to be a priest. Well, the picture couldn't come clear until they looked and they saw the brutality of the innocent one being sacrificed like a lamb on that cross. 
So this suffering one, we see the humiliation in which he came, the humbleness that he came, the rejection, the sacrifice, the, the obedience, submission, and ultimately the exaltation. And that's why the resurrection is so important. I've got like 40 slides after this one. I, I, I'm serious. If I was to go through it, but this morning, I started reading Isaiah 54, and I stopped. I'll show you. Look at all these slides I have for you. You want to stick around for all of them? Look at all those. But I read this this morning, and I don't know what happened. But just this overpowered me. And I thought I have to stop right here. Because this is the gospel. Think about it. Isaiah 53 is the gospel. It's about how God came into the flesh, His Son, sacrificed. He grew up innocent before men and in a way that nobody would have expected. They wanted Him to be royalty. And then as he came out, he was rejected. Even the power that he would show them, the wisdom, Rabbi, you're a great teacher, yet was rejected. And then he lost all rights and was oppressed through that trial. And that's, you could take Isaiah 53 and pattern it over every gospel message. This is what is the Jewish gospel. This is the Jewish gospel. This is just a one prophecy that the apostles could use with so much power that could turn 3,000 hearts on one day. That's the wisdom and beauty and the plan that God had for us. And it's still available. It's still available. If you're with us this morning, there's something that we can do to help you in your relationship with Him. I hope that you'll give us that opportunity. He's a beautiful Savior. I hope that if you've strayed away, that you would look within yourself and realize how beautiful of this suffering servant is. Have you joined him in the resurrection because that's a part of it as well in Romans chapter 6 3 and 4 one of the most beautiful passages is this idea of sharing in that that's what he says do you not know as many of us who were were baptized were baptized into his death and that we died and were buried as in his burial and that when we were raised we were raised like he was and we live in a newness of life and where do you get that you get that in the burial. You get that in your spiritual death. But it's the resurrection is where the glory's at. Because you're beating Satan. That is what is so amazing. You have beat Satan like Christ did. Satan played right into God's hand. Satan thought <laughs> when, when Jesus breathed his last, everybody thinks that somehow Satan knew everything. That he's omni-knowledgeable like God. No. He really thought that if he could kill the Son of God, he would win us. And, and God gave just enough information that he followed along and helped out mankind to kill the sacrifice that ironically would then save us. You see how God takes sometimes the most ugly things and can use it in spite of us to save us. He took the example of our sins and demonstrated it on the cross so that we could look at it. That it would then do what? Save us. Cause us to realize who we really are. So this morning, if we can help you in joining in Christ in that burial and joining that resurrection, if you haven't done that first, if you need the prayers of the church, anything, 
We urge you to please let us, let us serve you. So think about these things while we stand and sing. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, then now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from